As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you'll find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. And this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and they did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and they placed their cloaks of them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And then immediately after this entry of the hero to the crowds, we see what he does. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer. But you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. See, these are things the hero is doing, overthrowing the economical, economic system living off the temple, healing people. And as we look through, just think, this is our hero that we're talking about here. But when... But, yes, but when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what those children are saying, they asked him? Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? Have you never read that? And he left them and he went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. We pause for a moment in prayer. Lord, we're looking at this story from the point of view of the hero in it, yourself. I pray that you'd help us to see things that we need to see about the type of hero that you are and how we can follow in your footsteps and follow you, our hero. Amen. And that's what we have. It can hardly be a more triumphant entry into a place than to be there and the whole crowd are there. Do it, you know, what are they doing? Uh, they're taking their cloaks off and they put him on the ground so he's, him and the, his donkey and the, their feet don't get dirty. They're cutting down branches. And that interestingly, this is a time in the Jewish feast system where they do have wave palm fronds around. So there's a connection with the Jewish uh, way of doing things, their Jewish religion at this point. Uh, and they're shouting out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And so if you've got a, ki a hero coming in, that means that all these people are looking at this hero and they have all the expectations that go along with the fact that he is our hero. And they're hoping that their hero is going to say certain things. And they're going to hope that hero is going to be a certain type of person. And they hope that their hero is going to bring the things which they really prize in their own life, the things that they want to have happen, and things which they actually can't do. They need a hero to do it for them. And if you think into that context, you've got the Jews. What did they want their hero to do? Number one, rescue them from the Romans hoping he was going to be the hero who would do that. 
That's what they hoped for. But he wasn't the hero they were hoping for, was he? And I wonder if we really understand how different Jesus is as a hero. And because you need to understand that because it, you need to accurately know what the qualities of your hero are so you can expect the right things from him. And so we're going to tease that out a little bit and we're going to use the power of contrast by looking at, in human history, what did they think heroes were? And really, mankind is pretty predictable, isn't it? Apart from this hero, Jesus, just about every other hero has been someone with the power to conquer and rule others. The hero in the ancient Greek and Roman world, that was somebody who could strategize, he could form alliances, he could plot assassinations and grasp power. And their greatest model was Alexander the Great, who ruthlessly conquered from Greece all the way across into India. This hero considered himself divine and he ordered the Greek cities, he established Greek outposts all the way across, he ordered them to worship him as God. And he left his empire behind to, in his own words, I leave my empire to the strongest. How does that compare with Jesus? Jesus said, the poor and the meek will inherit the kingdom of God, not the strongest. And that, that invitation by Alexander the Great to the strongest meant that his lieutenants who came after him battled and within 50 years they tore the kingdom apart. It was gone. That philosophy, not really very successful. If you go from the Greeks to the Romans, the classic is Augustus Caesar, around about time of Christ. He was, for the Romans, he was the ideal Roman hero. So how did he get to be the hero? Well, he killed 300 senators, he killed 200 knights, and even the ageing or orator Cicero, the greatest orator that's been, and he made himself and his successors to be gods on earth. He established that concept of the Caesar as the hero. And who took this concept up? Later on, Napoleon Bonaparte. He tried to revive the Roman Empire and because he was modelling it on what Augustus had done. And what, it, what happened from there? He plunged Europe into terrible and mindless wars. And do we see anybody in our modern age trying to be a Caesar, to revive the power of an empire, the Soviet empire maybe? Trying to be the Caesar, the strong man, using whatever tools he can, Didn't ma doesn't matter if it's legal or illegal, he wants power. And that's the classical world's understanding of a hero, a person with power, and it's, it's almost universal. If you went from there to, across to India, in, and look at what the Hindus consider to be a hero, most of their gods and goddesses have got a, a weapon in their hands. And in fact, well-known criminals can win democratic elections in India and when they win, then their guilt's wiped away because they're the hero. And they also, for their heroes, they've got to conquer their own body. You know, see some of the strange things they do. They control their eating, their drinking, their, their sexuality, their in, even their breathing. And they lie on beds of nails. And, yeah, anyway. Because they're after power. Power over themselves. What about in Islam? An Islamic hero also is a person of power. But so you have to couple it in Islam with piety and with prayer. And so you can be a terrorist and be a devout Muslim and that makes you a hero in their eyes. If you go to the Middle Ages, uh, we had knights, you all know the mar knights marching, uh, riding on their horses, the Germanic barbarians, the Frank Frankish aristocrats, what did they prize there for the knight? He was personally very brave, he was physically strong, he was skilled in the use of arms uh, and he had prowess, you know, that capacity to beat other men in battle. That was the prized thing about the knight. And I wonder if we're any different when we compare us, when we think about our sports heroes. They have the power to beat other people. They're the hero. 
Interestingly, the Roman Catholic Church realised this was a problem. They tried to tame the power of knights, did it in a number of ways. Perhaps the most successful way, and you've all heard of King Arthur. And they developed the idea then of knights of God. And the knights, they said, well, you should really be taking on responsibility to serve God and the church and to use your strength to take care of the weak and vulnerable. But that couldn't be sustained because you had to be of noble birth and you had to be good at killing people. And eventually they did realise Jesus and his disciples were opposed to killing people and opposed to different levels of, of society, different stratas, the, the elite and the poor. It's not a Jesus value. It really was not until the time of Martin Luther that the idea of a hero who was closer to Jesus' idea of a hero, that, that was the first time we see it really appear. So what have we got in that time? We've got a church, a big organisation, very keen on making money, very keen on being the final authority, and very much against something which we take for granted, the common person's right to read the Bible. But in fact, they burned at the stake people who dared to translate the Bible into plain English. They burned John Wycliffe in the 14th century and William Tyndale in the 15th century. They brought Tyndale to trial for heresy because he believed in the forgiveness of sins. He believed that the mercy of the gospel story was enough for salvation, that faith alone justifies. His last prayer was, Lord, open the King of England's eyes, which, praise the Lord, was actually answered three years later. Henry VIII required every parish church in England to make a copy of the English Bible available to its parishioners. So in the face of a church with that much power, the power of life and death, it comes along Martin Luther, a professor. And he has the freedom, because he's a professor, he can submit his theories to other peers, other professors, just to you know, scrutinise them, see if I'm on the right track, you know. And he nailed 95 theses on the door of the Castle Church of Wittenberg. He wanted an academic debate. But the church didn't see it that way. Because he pointed out the church was in error by selling indulgences to the poor. You see, that's the idea that, all right, uh, if you pay us some money, then, then that means that your sins will be taken care of for a certain period of time and then you can do it again next week and have some more sins taken care of. He said, no, that's not right. And the church didn't like that. In fact, they summoned him to appear before the Emperor Charles to be tried for heresy. And although Luther was not trying to be a hero here, I'm going to read you some words that he wrote at the time. And I think you might get a sense of a new kind of hero, more like Jesus, in his words. He said, You ask me what shall I do if I'm called by the emperor? I'll go, even if I'm too sick to stand on my feet. If Caesar calls me, God calls me. If violence is used as it may well be, I commend my cause to God. He lives and reigns who saved the three youths from the fiery furnace of the king of Babylon. And if he will not save me, my head is worth nothing compared with Christ. This is no time to think of safety. I must take care that the gospel is not brought into contempt by our fear to confess and seal our teaching with our blood. And I think that last line for me is really powerful. I must take care that the gospel is not brought into contempt by our fear to confess and seal our teaching with our blood. And here we see the beginning of a new type of hero, one who was obedient to his conscience, and his conscience was captive to the word of God. And Luther was unleashing a new source of power for the Western world, which was actually the foundation of so many things we enjoy in our Western life, the power of truth. The power of truth. And so, as we think now of Jesus coming in on Palm Sunday at that first Easter, allowing himself to be crucified, we're seeing really a dramatically different type of hero released in our world. 
the world's heroes. They wanted to cultivate racial, geographical, linguistic, religious, class, pride and hatred, distinctions in order to grasp and maintain power and keep people down. And what's Jesus? The opposite. Jesus, our hero, makes love the supreme value of the kingdom of God. And when we say makes love the, same, the supreme value, we're not talking about hallmark cards. It's beyond loving your neighbours as yourself for enlightened self-interest. You know, oh, If I do treat them nicely, they'll treat me back nicely. It's beyond that. It goes to the incredible extent of allowing yourself to be sacrificed in an excruciatingly painful way for the good, not just of those you love, but for the good also of your enemies. And that is a challenge. For those of us who may be a bit angry with what the government's been, how the government's been handling uh, the COVID thing, consider Jesus' words whilst he's, na he's actually nailed on the cross. And he's speaking about those people who have put him there. And he says in Luke 23, verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. And I know it's tempting to want to bring all those responsible in authority for the, all the things we hold against authority. But if we want to give them a good flogging, Remember, that would be a misuse of power too. Wanting to be more powerful than them so we can deal with them. And we'll see on the crosses that Jesus' heroism replaces a strong man's brutality with love. It replaces the pride of life. You know, if you've ever seen that warrior spirit and seen the way wrestlers in the ring talk about to one another or warriors diss the other people, Jesus replaces that strong brutality with love, with pride of life, with meekness. He replaces domination over others with self-sacrificing service. Jesus demonstrated what the kingdom of God is all about, not by coming in on that procession, all the crowds are with him on Palm Sunday, he's going into Jerusalem. He didn't go straight up to Pilate and say, mate, out of here, I'm now here. What did he do? He washed his disciples' feet. He came not to be served, but to serve. He came not to kill, but to give eternal life. And he didn't do it from a comfy, safe, golden crown in heaven. He lived the message. He lived the painful, chaotic, uncertain life we live on earth. And if you truly understand that type of heroism, then you will... Well, people who understand that type of heroism display the power of the gospel to transform. One example from India of their first prime minister, Pandit Jahawal, oh, Nehru. He said in 1963, he said, Fellow citizens... I have come to you as your first servant because that's what the term prime minister literally means, first servant. And no ruler in the whole of India's long history had ever seen themselves as a servant. They were rulers. Why was this guy transformed? He'd been to England. And in England, he studied there, many heroes have died to take the power from the kings and give it to the servants, the ministers. And accordingly, the first servant had become more important than the king. And so we see that example in Matthew chapter 27. Whoever wants to be great amongst you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Most of us don't realise that our modern Western world was birthed in theological controversies which now just seem trivial to us. Take, for example, the notion of equality. 
particularly as Aussies, you know, we don't like to feel that anyone's better than us. We're all equal here. But before the Bible became available for anyone to read in their native language, there were centuries of the opposite of that, elitism, where everybody seemed to be better than you. And in Europe, there were three tiers. There was the intellectual elite, and these guys spoke Latin. And the Bible was their book. If you, if you ever wondered why did they have the Mass in Latin for so many years, because they thought it was elite. The elite only the elite people should be able to understand that. They used the Latin Vulgate, translated by St. Jerome, and that was their Bible for a thousand years. A thousand years of inequality. Underneath them, there's the nobility, and they spoke French or it's Anglo-Norman dialect, and they had some scriptures in their dialect. And at the bottom were what we would be called the illiterate parent, peasants, who just spoke primitive English, and hardly anyone thought I was necessary to enlighten them. They're just the peasants. Why would you need to do that? Elitism like that kept most of the people down. And interesting thing is when they finally translated the Bible into English so that the common, so that the so-called primitive people could read it for themselves, they discovered amazing things from the Bible. They discovered that caring for the poor and oppressed is a key biblical value. They discovered that the Bible is a philosophy of freedom. It has the capacity to judge the lifestyle and the teachings of the medieval church as it has the capacity to judge our authorities in, in this day and age. Wycliffe pointed out to them that God, not the church, chooses who gets to be saved. Right? He pointed out that the priests don't magically turn the bread and wine into the very blood and body of Christ at communion. That's what you find if you read the Bible. They discovered that Jesus preached the good news to the poor, not just to the elite. And so Christian leaders realised that they needed to turn away from this, this system that was, keeping, uh, that, was, that was keeping people away from God. Because they discovered that every believer was a priest. It's called the priesthood of all believers. And they discovered that earthly authority came from the gathered priests, the congregation, and didn't come from the Pope. It was so sad that they had the battle had to be against the church itself. But for most parts, that's no longer a battle. Praise the Lord. But now we have the isms battling against the Bible. We have the Marxism, we have Islamism, Hinduism, Chinese communism, liberalism, the, there's so many of them. And I'd just like to talk about a few of them, a few of the isms. And one of them is Buddhists. And they call salvation nirvana. And what does nirvana mean? Not heaven like we think. Nirvana is a permanent extinction of your individual existence. D dissolving this illusion that you're an individual into what they call shunyata, the void, into nothingness or emptiness. And they say you need to be free from this misery-causing illusion that you have a permanent core to yourself, that you have a self, that you have a soul. You need to become nothing. Well, Kurt Cobain, you might have heard, the lead singer of the rock band, Nirvana, that's about their, their, their heaven, he adopted that, voice, that view completely. And you say, well, it sounds okay, maybe. What was the fruit of it? Well, he suicided. Because the logical consequence of this belief is there's nothing out there to give meaning and significance to anything in life. Very similar, the Hindus, they believe in reincarnation and Brahma, it's a universal self. And similarly to Buddhists, they think that salvation requires dissolving your consciousness into a universal consciousness or God. What's the fruit of that belief, thinking that? Well, if you have too many children to support, then it's quite fine to just starve the excess children to death. Yeah, just a liability. And, and you can even torture a bride in order to get more dowry from her parents. Because you see, for them, in that system, children are not human beings with intrinsic worth because they're made in the image of God. They're just assets or liabilities. And Hindu belief is actually offended when Westerners come along and they want to alleviate the massive poverty and suffering they see uh, because they believe the poor are poor because 
It's karma. So basically, it's their fault. And if you relieve their suffering, then you're preventing them from paying for what they've done in previous lives. Oh, amazing. Islam, they, they deny God's right to become a man. They say, for God to become a creature as lowly as a dog, that would violate the dignity of God. And they have this saying, can God also become a dog? They're, I'm saying, I'm pointing to these things to say how amazing Jesus is. When he came and took on flesh, it was a proof of our dignity, not our need to be nothingness, not our need to be uh, paying through karma for what we've done in previous lives. It's saying that we can be saved. It's saying we can be a friend of God, a child of God. And that this, when God became flesh and blood, that made us worth more, of greater worth than the angels even. Islam, that failed to appreciate that, the value and the dignity of human beings, and it holds back the potential of their people. The Marxists who ruled the Soviet Union, they said, oh, this individual value, that's just a manufactured concept. It comes from the middle class, they called them the bourgeoisie. And this class, they just want to be independent, they want to be, have private property and free economy. Well, what's the fruit of their belief? It was the starvation of three and a half to seven million Ukrainians under Stalin in the 1930s and a current invasion under Putin. And you can, if you want to know why the Ukrainians are not happy about it, they've got history with the Russians. Contrast to that, the fruit of the Bible, what did it do? Well, we see people who took on that biblical message, particularly in America, they had what are called great awakenings, mass spiritual revivals. And the word of God came through and people became Christians. And what did it do? It gave a hunger to know the truth, a hunger to know the Bible. And what did it do? It lifted uh, them out of poverty, made America strong, made it powerful. But sadly, as America drifts away from the Bible again, we see that's drifting away too. One of the interesting things I found that came out of a biblical worldview and is the fact that the, the Christians developed technology. Now, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Why technology? Instead of just letting everything carry on in this useless world. Well, what did the Bible say? It says four things which led to the development of technology. Firstly, the Bible recognises the intelligent craftsmanship in the way the world is designed. You know, God did it really well. Verse 2, well, verse two, point 2, because we are made in the image of God, we can be creative in images, creative workers, creative artisans, just as like he did. We can, you know, we've got some capacity as a reflection of God's artisanship. Uh, three, we follow God's example when we use the physical universe for righteous ends. And then fourthly, the Bible challenges us to use our time wisely for each moment we have is a valuable moment. It's a one-time opportunity. Did you know that modern technology sprang from monks in monasteries? The Benedictine mon Benedictines came to believe there's, there's a distinction between toil and work. You know what work is? That's like God, you do good stuff, you make stuff. But toil is a curse on human sin. And that's it. There are some things which are just mindless, they're repetitive, they're dehumanising things we need to do. And so they realise that human beings shouldn't have to do what wind or water or horses can do. They realised they could use their brains creatively to liberate humans from the curse of toil. And so in the 16th century... Uh, <clears throat> An abbot, Gregory of Tours, encouraged the invention or the repurposing of the water mill to relieve monks of the uh, grind of grinding their grain, the toil of grinding grain. In fact, they developed water-powered machines for milling, they developed it for tanning, they developed it for blacksmithing and other industries. They even had an automatic flour sifter attached to their flour mill. And from that, they developed... The, ca the crank, I don't know the, what you're talking about, that crank, that enabled machines to replace the human arm. 
And you could go on and on about all the ways in which people who have biblical values have, have blessed the world. It's a massive topic. And so when you hear people saying Christianity is hate speech, it's irrelevant, or it's downright nasty, they don't know what they're talking about. They have not done hi looked at history. They're just spouting an idea they heard somewhere on a coffee cup, maybe. So to wrap it up, the secular mindset in which we live in Australia has been trying to convince us that what we're doing at Easter time is just a little spiritual diversion. We're free to enjoy it. It doesn't have any impact on the real world. And they're wrong. The real heroes who have made our Western world a better place are men and women of strengths, moral strengths, who have followed the teachings of the Bible. And we maintain that the hero we follow didn't come as a hero with brute strength. He didn't come as a hero with political power, as the world has suffered greatly at the hands of over history. But we have a hero who came with these things. He came with love. Romans 5, verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, uh, for a good person, some might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his, own, his love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Our hero came with love. Our hero came with truth when he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Our Saviour came to give us dignity by loving us so much. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We are made in the image of God. We reflect God in some way. We have creative power of reasoning. We have strength. We have intellect to create, intellect to maintain, intellect to build for the glory of God for the service of mankind, not for our service of us, just as he did. And we're called to live righteously as he did. And when we believe in our hero and we commit to him, he comes into our lives in the person of the Holy Spirit. And you want to know what's the fruit of that? Galatians 5, the fruit of God being in your life is love and it's joy and it's peace. It's forbearance, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, it's self-control. You know, this resentment that we feel towards authorities about lockdowns and vaccinations and masks, we resent it because we've been free for so long. We don't like our freedom being taken away. But let's never forget that the freedom that we've been enjoying was won by people who believed in the Bible, who believed in Jesus. We've been living in the fruit of belief in biblical values. And if you want your freedom back, it won't come from mankind's normal way, from brute strength. It'll come from Jesus' way, living Jesus' way. And that'll be raising our voices in favour of truth. And it will come from following the values of the right hero. Are you looking for a real hero? There is only one. And those who follow him have changed the world. They've made our Western world what it is. Are you also going to be a world changer? Let us pray. Gracious Lord, believing what we read in the Bible is incredibly against the history of mankind. But you have shown us the way. And I pray, Lord, that you would empower us to live the way and to truly follow our hero, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so forgive us our trespasses, forgive us our sins, forgive us our doubting the absolutely amazing, revolutionary message that we have in you. And let us be bold and fearless to proclaim truth. As Martin Luther did back in the day, that's been encouraged by his words. 
Let's be encouraged to know that the Lord Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Thank you.